Okay. Uh, very nice. So, uh, so yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome by Matt Colloquium. Uh, I have a, a great pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Stefan Bauer as today's Biomed Colloquium speaker, uh, who is an expert in biomedical application of AI. Uh, he got his PhD in computer science from uh, ETH Zurich, and, and actually he was awarded with the uh, uh, best thesis. Uh, and in 2019, he also won the best paper award uh, at the ICML, and then also in 2000 and 2011 on the follow-up. And then uh, actually he was an assistant professor at uh, KTH Stockholm, but he recently moved to the uh, Germany, Helmholtz and uh, Technical University in Munich. So uh, please uh, welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Bauer. Thanks a lot for the very nice uh, introduction and and uh, for the invitation especially to give this talk mm -hmm. and um i'm i'm very excited to speak about the topic and i'm i'm still um uh, working in that area and have quite uh, some projects ongoing and i'm actually looking for um collaborators as, as well so if something in this talk seems interesting to you or you see connection points especially for biomedical applications mm -hmm. please reach out mm -hmm. and um Unfortunately, I need to point out that right now Helmholtz, where my main affiliation is at the moment, uh, suffered from a cyber attack, and said, mm -hmm. which is why oh. that our IT systems are basically down. Oh. Um, and implying that I don't receive emails as of now on my official email address. <laughs> so um, either, for example, write me an email to my former KTH email address, which is Bauer, so without uh -huh. the R at the end. Um, or I reach out on Twitter or any other channel. But unfortunately, wow. if you would use my main email address <laughs> as of now, I, I would not receive it. Wow. And in case you reached out for this talk because you wanted to discuss something, I'm, that is the reason I'm very sorry that in case I didn't answer, I just didn't have access to my inbox um, and, and couldn't couldn't okay. reply to anything. I hope that gets resolved in the in the next week. But but till then, please use use one of these contact channels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, this I can jump and now I can uh, speak a little bit first um, of, of some of the success stories we've seen in, in AI. Most have actually, some of these, at least uh, three, have been very much driven by, by industry uh, labs. So on, on the left, we see an example of um, the, the nature cover of AlphaGo, where, um, the, the, where a system was designed which was able to play to to play in exceptionally well. Similar success stories have been seen, for example, for image classification, or now most recently in the middle this chat uh, GPT um, or language understanding, as well as previously one of the first success stories, which is on the top right, was actually playing Atari games. And what all of these uh, systems have in common is that um, the first case is typically for these we use we used or at the time at least large. Um, large and widely available compute. And the second aspect is that um, typically it involved a very clean data set that was even true to some extent for protein folding, which is another success story. Um, and that at the very beginning, um, we actually could uh, simulate an abundance of data because for example, in Atari games, we had video underlying video game principles where you were not restricted in, in data curation. And this, um, leaves the question to some extent, um, assuming that computers are available across um, all these applications or across disciplines, and that in many applications, for example, we we, we, we already have clean data sets or in some data applications where we have these, why don't we see the same success stories? And one of these applications is actually still, I would argue, medi the medical field or even the biomedical field. And they have been due to tremendous efforts from the community. They have been um, curation efforts like the Human Cell Atlas, the UK Biobank, or the Mimic data sets where huge amounts of data have been stored and been made widely accessible to the, to the community. So there are for sure large data sets available in these areas, but yet as of now, potentially that might change. We have not seen the same success as with these other applications I mentioned before. And since computers widely available, I will mostly speak on potentially 
um, algorithms, which might be the, the missing algorithms or missing links in algorithms, which might be one of the reasons why that success is a little bit lacking. And especially for benchmarks, which we can use to advance the field, similarly to something like ImageNet, where we had a clear goal in improving and actually were able to do so using um, these, these um, uh, available benchmarks. And in order to illustrate that this is a non-trivial problem in biomedicine, I actually want to show two examples. Um, one is actually from industry, and it's already a little bit old. So it's um, from, from 2016. It was the first paper, and then the validation came in 2020. And that is from Google or, or Alphabet and one of its subsidiaries. And they actually curated and developed a, a data set and then developed an, an approach for diabetic retinopathy in retinal Windows image uh, photographs. And at the beginning, when they then deployed it, um, so when they trained it on the curated data set, it performed so well, and it's it's extremely useful um, um, and, and, and uh, would actually solve a, an important real world problem. But then when they shifted it, sorry, and to apply it to the real world, they realized that due to distribution shifts and um, problems in standardization, it was actually much more different in, in the real world and when deploying these systems than one would normally potentially expect with an IT product. And by now, to be fully fair to them, they were able to, to fix these problems and um, indicating, however, that if such a big lab and such an experienced lab like uh, Google ha faces these problems, what is the chance potentially that an academic lab could do something similar? And um, to be fair, I actually want to show one example where my own group was involved in a project that has seemed to be very, very difficult. And this is from the recent um, COVID um, pandemic. And what we wanted to develop was, especially at the beginning, where it looked like that um, potentially the, the hospitals would suffer from um, too, too many potential patients and where there was a necessity for resource allocation. We wanted to develop an early warning system, which um, patients are at risk of, for example, being shifted to the ICU or, or being intubated or which would um, uh, potentially face, face death. And that on the top, you see here the sequential organ failure assessment. This is a general score, mm -hmm. which is among the most state-of-the-art approaches in a sense, or the most established. And what you see here is basically that it stays flat until the moment, like at the very end of the intubation, there is something happening. And But intubation is already, um, as a, for intubation, you're already at the ICU. Right. And only when you intubate, basically, the, the patient is indicated of at risk can sequentially this patient unfortunately died. And here's this um, COVID um, early warning score we developed. It's at least indicating a trend, mm -hmm. um, showing a clear trend towards the death that it's getting more and more at risk. And what is interesting about that application is that we had access in, during COVID because data sharing was potentially a little bit easier or the need was more clear. Um, people were able to develop systems very fast and even large scale systems. So this was, so originally we had access to a tremendous data set. And then we cleaned it down to roughly 100,000 patients across 70, roughly 70 hospitals. I mean, that's a huge, like a diverse number of hospitals, like multiple locations across continents, um, over 100,000 cleaned um, patients. That's a very, that's an amazing data set, so to say, um, so like a, 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 a large one. And what you see on the right is basically that still, there are significant problems with um, the classification on minority groups. And now it's surprisingly um, a different minority group because COVID originally uh, originated more and was more predominant early on in the, in the Asian space, Asian geographic. We had more data from Asian patients. And what you see here is that basically on holdout data sets, all approaches, not just our own, even for longer prediction horizons, so up to multiple days in advance, they perform significantly better than for minority groups in these data sets. And here, opposite to nearly all other cases, here Caucasians were the minority group because oh. it reached basically COVID um, reached there a little bit later. Mm. And what you see here is that basically at least some approaches just they fail completely to generalize to these patients mm -hmm. and all approaches significantly suffer. Mm -hmm. And this shows basically one of these problems in, in, in the medicine uh, medical field that we always have some rare cases. We always have a huge variance between patients. Um, how can we make sure that these systems, when we deploy them, would actually generalize to these new patients and to these new subtypes or even unseen ethnicities? And then ethnicity is a relatively large 
subtype, so to say. And in order to focus that, I would like to explain potentially how causality can help and how we can maybe make uh, progress towards designing these systems. And for that, I will first give a very brief introduction to causality and some approaches at the intersection of causality and deep learning, which are these okay. neural causal models, and hopefully speak a little bit about benchmarks and representation learning, where we might not directly observe some of these variables, um, but need to learn higher level of abstractions of them. Mm -hmm. So this is roughly the plan for today's talk. Mm -hmm. And um, and in, in, in case um, you have any questions, please write them in the chat and I will answer them afterwards, yeah. or especially reach out to me um, through these email addresses if you want to discuss further. So what is a quick primer for um, causal structure learning? So here is a very old example <laughs> from 2012, but it's a very popular one. Yeah. And um, there are a couple of, so it's also a, a lot of countries here on the bottom left move up and want significantly more Nobel prizes by now. The yeah. other aspect, which is out, uh, v clearly visible here is that Switzerland and Germany has a have a different quality. In, in chocolate potentially, and that Sweden is, is, is clearly winning and, and punching above its weight with respect to Nobel Prizes. Uh -huh. um, and now the underlying question is basically what would happen if I consume much more chocolate? So if on <laughs> this x-axis, I basically move like uh, three, three times this axis to the right, and then ask the question, how many Nobel Prizes would that actually give me? And in order to answer that question, you need to make a causal assumption. So you either need to, so, in case you don't make an assumption, you can simply not answer that question. So it would be okay to say, um, and you would actually have to say, I cannot answer that question because, for example, it's not included in my training distribution or something like that. But if you want to answer that question, you need to make an assumption, and it's very important that you state it. So, for example, if you say there's no relation or there's a clear relation, it might significantly, it will influence where on where on these charts you would you would actually place a chocolate consumption of let's say 30 if it's just a stable line so on the same level like switzerland or if it's double switzerland and and so on and um the problem is a little bit and why you need to state it is that all possible answers at least on this chart are uh, equally um correct so if you say that uh, for example there's no connection because there's a hidden confounder like the wealth of a country which influences our ability to consume chocolate as well as the Nobel prizes then um, your answer is equally um, is, is un indistinguishable from this data set alone com mm -hmm. um, compared to the answer that there's no um, causation from chocolate consumption to Nobel prices um, or that the causation actually goes in the other direction. So everyone would be right in, in that sense. Um, but of course, here we can debug it, but it's still yeah. even despite the fact um, that for chocolate consumption, you can do a lot of things like uh, trials. It's a non-trivial uh, a non-trivial problem. And um, in this talk, I especially focus on, 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 on the task, how we can learn some of these structures mm -hmm. um, given that we might not already know it. So here in this case, we will most likely conclude that there's a hidden confounder. But you can actually see that this is a tough question or a tough choice by asking that to chat GPT. <laughs> so for example, does eating chocolate increases uh, my chances of winning a Nobel Prize? And here it's a relatively long answer. But basically it says, um, yeah, that, that might not be the case, but it's likewise not that clear. And I find that quite surprising that in, in the medical field, we often have the effect of a drug, for example, or we might, for ethical reasons, we might not even able to study it. While for chocolate, it should be a very clear setup potentially. So for you for sure find volunteers for such a trials because you would provide chocolate for free or placebo for free. And despite this fact, this answer is surprisingly hard to, um, this question is surprisingly hard to answer conclusively from the existing data alone, while we would expect to be there algorithmically a very clear answer, but we need common sense to basically debug it. And that shows us Hopefully, where we can go with algorithm development, that at some point we become equally good as our common sense for even for cases where we might not be able to debug it like this, and um, for answering some of these questions where it might not be so trivial as for um, chocolate versus Nobel Prize consumption. But what is actually um, the, the the problem in causality? So one of these key problems is that the space of um, causal graphs, which we can learn from data, grow super exponentially. Mm -hmm. So here on the right, you see basically the number of nodes in a graph. 
the number of attacks and the number of of graphs this this would um, the, 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 this would imply. And so for for three nodes, so it's just this example of before Nobel prizes, chocolate consumption, and potentially a hidden confounder. We would already have um, potentially twenty five um, different decks. And if I only have ten nodes, so it's a, a relatively clear number. I don't even know what that number is because it's so huge already. And so this space grows super exponentially, and um, it's a it's a, a a discrete search space which doesn't make it easier. And um, even in the case that um, we have the data and that we can search through it, so using some optimization technique, it might still be not the right answer we get because it will actually be a distribution of DAGs, for example, which are equally likely under this data set and not just a single DAG. So Potentially, we would need to get a distribution over all equally likely DAGs, which can explain the data equally well, um, and not just a single one. So previously, in the example, I showed three DAGs, so um, uh, chocolate consumption causing Nobel prizes the other way around, or hidden confounder. And in that case, only um, we would as well like to receive as an answer all these possible graphs and not just a single one, because all of them are equally likely. And now you can see that in these high spaces, it's becoming increasingly unlikely that um, you will get all possible decks which would explain the data. And even if, um, if, if you get them, it's still a very hard problem what you do with that amount of, of, of possible graphs. But um, where can it actually help? And what is the connection, for example, with modern deep learning and generalization? And one of the insights, or one of these heuristics is that um, the factorization, which is typically tied to causality, and generalization are tightly connected, but it's only a heuristic. So on the right, we can see an example of two possible factorizations uh -huh. corresponding potentially to two different graphs. Uh -huh. So imagine that there's an event A, which might be that um, it rains, and an event B, which might be that I open an umbrella. Here again, common sense would tell us what the cause is. But imagine that there's now a shift in the underlying distribution or in the data, for example, because the weather changes. Then in the first factorization, we, are, we might need to update for this event A, the, our probability that it rains. But the probability that we open the umbrella, given that it rains, which is the mechanism, the mechanism will not... Um, need to be changed. The mecha mechanism is invariant. And so this factor we would not need to change. But in the other factorization, if our opening the umbrella causes the rain, we and um, the probability and the underlying weather changes, we would need to update the probability that we open the umbrella and the factor uh, and the probability that um, it rains given that we opened the umbrella. So here we would need to update two factors, while in the above one we would only need to update one factor. Now it's a it's a heuristic that updating one factor would take significantly less samples than updating two factors. So that depends on the shape of these distributions and so on. So potentially that might not be true in all um, examples, but we assume that this is one this is true in in most applications. And there's a um, a higher level connection to deep learning that because here in the first case we saw that we need to update less parameters, which would indicate our causal factorization. While in standard deep learning, every parameter participates to every relationship between all these variables, and, and which potentially can lead to this poor transferability, domain generalization, or catastrophic forgetting. Because if a change in distribution happens, um, what we would need to do is update all these factors in, in this parameterization. While um, potentially we would need to, we would want to update only one. Right now, we only use heuristics in practice to to circumvent that. For example, by fine tuning a last layer, um, but that might not be theoretically or the the um, correct way to do that. It's just um, an approximation to get away with it and, and and solve the issue in the real world. But what can you do potentially, or what can you might you want to change differently? So here I mentioned that basically the causal model is expected to adapt faster. And mm -hmm. one of the approaches you can now develop is to try to use that as a learning signal. So um, here we basically try to identify the causal model as the one which adapts faster. But now you can basically try to use that as a learning signal for identifying the causal model. So the idea is that you use this adaptation rate, so the adaptation rate to interventional samples, for example, as a learning signal. So you sample multiple graphs, and then you try 
um, you try to see which of these graphs or factorizations adapts faster with respect to the number of samples you need to see to a change in, in, in these underlying uh, distributions. So what you can do is if you are um, uh, what was one of these uh, very popular approaches now are these so-called neural causal models and here's just one example of it it's already there's already a very broad um, a broad family of these where you can have different strategies and different parametrizations but typically you try to parameterize everything by a neural network so both the functional parameters which are these conditional relationships so this is basically given that um, x causes y the relationship um, and the precise um, strength of this relationship is parameterized by a neural network. And the structure parameters um, are likewise um, parameterized here by the soft adjacency matrix. And so from this adjacency matrix, you can basically get um, the relationship between these variables and for these functional parameters, you get how they are connected. And the key advantage is that if you use neural network to, for example, neural networks to um, parameterize these functional relationships and these parameters, you can use um, continuous optimization, so stochastic gradient descent, um, such that you basically search um, you search continuously rather than iterating through all possible tags and scoring each, each graph against um, each other and comparing each graph against each, each other. And that is a key advantage with respect to scalability of these approaches. So here, the takeaway from this slide, in case that I provide a couple of references for that, but the key takeaway is basically that using um, neural networks and having access to more interventional data, so not just observational, but interventional data where you are able to, to evaluate how quick some of these graphs um, adapt to some of these interventional samples, allows you to do continuous optimization and scaling causal discovery up to higher dimensions. And this is actually what you see here. So if we apply these, uh, these tools um, to, um, here it's just on simulated data, but if you apply these tools on a single GPU, you can infer DAGs up to a, um, a thousand nodes in roughly a day. Mm -hmm. um, however, you need observational and interventional data. So only on purely observational data, it will not be enough to actually uh, learn, uh, learn a graph. It's not enough signal. So the key is here the combination of observational and interventional data. And for what can you now use that in, in biomedicine? Because you need these interventions. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, I think it's it's one of the big hopes in our field that mm -hmm. biomedical um, uh, bi biomedical data sets will now be able uh, to help us make systematic progress towards this goal, to this goal because they provide data sets which have these numbers of interventions and um, which are key for learning these causal models. So from observational data, I mentioned it's um, basically impossible without absolutely strict assumptions on how the data was generated to infer a causal DAG from, from the data set. And I would actually say that practically it's near hopeless. But in um, if you have interventional data, you have much more signal and then it seems to become possible. And what the recent data sets are, so here from last year from MIT, is genome-wide perturbsy data sets. So basically you have a transcriptomic readout. So you basically have an expression matrix of genes versus cell, um, where then individual cells are knocked out or knocked down, and you can study this effect. And this was in this to some extent already sounds like a very cool application for these neural causal models because you have um you have you you are potentially interested in large networks, so up to a thousand uh, up to the underlying gene regulatory network of um, up to thousands of genes. You have lots of interventional data. So here you have uh, thousands of perturbations. And on these data sets, you hope that it's possible. One of the key assumptions is, however, that you directly operate and that it makes sense to operate on the level of genes. So this does not involve representation learning per se. You say you directly operate on genes and want to learn the underlying network between these genes and that these observations you have actually correspond to these variables of interest. And we run some of, mm. of, uh, of these network inference approaches mm. for precisely the data set I, I mentioned below. Mm -hmm. And here it's a cell line. It's a more studied cell line. So the uh, Joseph Reprogler and his collaborators, they created, I think, three cell lines with uh, thousands of, um, of, uh, of perturbations. And here's the most studied cell line. And what you see here is, so because we are 
really coming from machine learning, it's half fast to evaluate, and this is actually a key problem. What we use for evaluation is the string database. So in this string database, you basically have different levels of reported inter-protein-protein -protein interactions. So some might be experimentally verified, some might just exist in the literature. And here you have multiple other competing methods for these gene regulatory network inferences. And what you see here, so here across um, the x-axis, basically it doesn't matter so much. It's just that it's consistent across um, uh, ex experimentally verified or, or, or um, um, interactions which have only been mentioned in, in the literature. Basically, these curves look very similar. Cool. And what you would conclude from this cell line is that it's this um, approach, which we just call method here, which is one of these neural causal models trained um, by having the speed of adaptation on these data sets, seems to perform better with respect to this overlap. However, so this is the first look on this data set. However, if you then change it to a different cell line, so here it was this RPE perturb um, cell line in case you want to try to repeat these, these experiments. But if you change now the, um, the, the cell line of the data set you use and you actually use a different one, so here's K562, um, yeah, which, which I think, um, I, I think I mentioned it wrongly. Uh -huh. uh, this K562 is the better uh, known and studied cell line overall uh -huh. in, in the literature. And what you see here is that these approaches generally, like across all methods, the approaches shift up in performance mm -hmm. um, with respect to um, trying, um, reported fraction of gene pairs in this protein-protein interaction pairs. And some of these um, uh, baselines, for example, here, it's uh, Arachne performs now incredibly well. It's basically um, telling you, it's giving you um, a, a perfect score. And so what we conclude to some extent from these preliminary mm. studies is that what we see consistently across these uh, analysis is the more well-known and well-studied a cell line is, the more links are reported. So the denser networks get, the more you study it. Mm. And the more well-known and well-studied a cell line is, the better correlation-based methods seem to perform both with respect to reported links in the literature and experimentally verified links. So it somehow seems for us that to some extent, it seems to indicate that we um, observe correlations and that we do science by observing these correlations and then testing these correlations. And to some extent, this seems to lead this, um, this seems to lead then to the fact that correlation-based methods perform a little bit better because how that is possible across literature links, which I, you can probably explain that um, 10 people then stu study it and then one finds it experimentally verified and then reports it while the negative results are not necessarily reported. But how that is possible, I, I'm, I'm not directly sure, but this is something we find consistently and I believe raises a little bit this question how, how we perform that, that science, but it seems to indicate that we are guided by correlation to, to do um, experiment decisions. And what would be a much nicer approach for actually studying um, these networks is that we um, evaluate not necessarily with respect to the reported links in the string database, but actually try something like transfer learning across cell lines. So for example, we study a network on one cell line with perturbations, and then we try to transfer our findings and these underlying networks to a different um, to a different cell line or at least a different location where these um, perturbations were performed. But due to certain batch effects and, and data creation problems, I think we are not yet there. So when we tried that, that was extremely hard and didn't perform, perform so well. And then another aspect I think is interesting is that in case we actually do infer these underlying networks of a thousand dimensions, it's actually unclear what we precisely do with it because it's such a hard problem to validate them. So if I give you a, a thousand dimensional DAG with, um, which don't just contain one link, but hundreds of links, then just visualizing that network is actually a very hard problem. And then you can't just necessarily always look on certain sub problems because it's, um, it might be hard to validate even sub networks if you don't exclude other variables. So even for humans, it's very hard to validate these extremely high dimensional DAGs. And, um, but this is something I'm, I'm very excited about. And I think we, we, we definitely need to, uh, to make more progress towards, towards this goal. And there's another aspect I want to now talk a little bit in, in the remaining time. And that is actually experimental design and interactive learning. So far, we have assumed 
that um, we basically are provided with interventional data somehow, but we, are, but we didn't decide on what intervention to perform. So we didn't create the interventional data and potentially where you intervene and how you generate this interventional data will significantly um, influence how fast you can converge and help you um, in actually learning the underlying system. Um, so um, what you want to do is basically you build an underlying, you build a, a first model. You use that, for example, to generate some hypothesis where um, you might be able to differentiate between underlying graphs. And then and this is basically the next experiment and data point you want to sample. Then you improve your model and then you continue to do that in, in a certain loop. And we actually tried to create um, a, a relative similar setup to that in Gene Disco. So we created multiple publicly available data sets where you then um, pretend that the data was newly generated by basically simulating such an experimental cycle. And we even hosted a community challenge last year at, at uh, ITLI on that. There's a new challenge this year just by, by GSK where we tested different acquisition functions. So you basically have already a subset of data. You can train a model on top. Mm -hmm. And then you, you want to decide how to basically query and design functions which tell you which is the next experiment to run. Mm -hmm. And um, you can test some of these approaches on these data points. But what we see here as one example is, so in this graph, it doesn't look too good, but it's a very handpicked graph is that it's nearly all methods are basically overlapping to some extent in most of the plots and that random is a relatively competitive baseline compared to um, harder acquisition functions um but yeah so i think generally we need to make significantly progress towards um towards this goal of of um, designing very informative experiments because we cannot just assume that we can perform all possible experiments or that it's necessarily cheap. And one way where we actually showed that this was very, um, that okay. it was significantly possible to outperform random compared to the above um, presentation in, in this genetic experiments mm -hmm. was materials discovery. And why do I mention it? And I mention it because what was extremely helpful there, so you have this active learning loop or experimental design loop, where you want to discover new materials. So in this case, it was invar alloys. Alloys are basically compositions. Invar alloys are basically compositions, which are invariant to temperature changes with respect to their expansion. So if you heat that alloy or cool it down, it has the same expansion. So it has the same volume, um, which is kind of neat for a couple of applications. And um, what was key for significantly outperforming random was having access to simulations which can mimic the real world, which might not be perfect, but which can mimic it. Um, and in the case of materials discovery, you have that because you can perform DFT calculations and thermodynamic calculations. You still need an expert to do them. So it's, it's a very hard subfield and problem to do that on its own. But once you have access to some of these oracles, which can tell you a rough answer like these simulations, which might still be very costly, you can significantly outperform random. And so one of the big questions for me and for, for biomedicine is, part, part, uh, is partially how then can we get um, and design similar algorithms in, in, in biomedicine? So how can we get a simulator, let's say, of a cell, for example, or how can we get a simulator of some of these gene networks um, and simulate to these DFT calculations where you have an expert um, which designs and runs these, these, these calculations? I think just from a machine learning perspective, we won't be able to build that simulator from our community. So here we really need interdisciplinary work to come up with ideas, to come even up with improvements, like even for DFT, it took a significant sub-community to, to build that. And, um, but once these become available, and they might not be the ground truths, but you can use them to basically tell you when to query the real world, which is still much more expensive. And, and, and then these exploration strategies become much more significant and, 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 and helpful. So I think that is, if, if there's a takeaway for future research um, you are interested in and, and want to reach out, then for sure building simulators of these systems, mm -hmm. how to build it, or at least take first steps, that I would be super excited to talk about. Okay. And now in the remaining 10, 10 minutes, I want to speak a little bit about causal representation learning. I hope it's not too many topics in, in, mm -hmm. in this talk. But it's one of the uh, one of the 
uh, aspects we, we have not spoken yet so far about, but which are quite important. And that is that in many applications, we, we don't directly observe these variables of interest. So we don't get an Excel sheet with a CSV file with where these variables and measurements are indicated. So we might have that, but in many applications we don't. So for example, medical imaging or in robotics, we, we often don't will not get that. What we will get is, for example, low level um, information, let's say pixel values. So you don't get directly a segmented object, but you get basically here a robot picking up this cube and you will only receive for example the sensor data from this sensor tip if there's a contact yes or no and this low level um, pixel information and then the key is that you need to learn somehow a representation um, which you can hopefully um, repurpose and reuse across different tasks so for example if the task is for a robot to pick um, up uh, to sort all objects by color in, in this scene then basically the factor of color and the position of the object will, will matter, but size will not matter. So in the downstream task for sorting by, by color, you hope to build a smaller and so more robust model by just including factors like color and position. While if the task is sort all objects by size, then position and size will matter, but color will be a nuisance factor. And you hope to be able to build a better and smaller and more efficient model and more robust model for the downstream task of sorting by size by excluding the factor of, of color. So you hope to basically separate some of these factors or learn corresponding entities from these low level in, information such that you can then build much more robust and more general applicable uh, model. And we are only in the very early stages to do that. And one of the aspects why I showed here robotic um, um, uh, example is that at least in robotics, we know what that should mean, like what these factors should correspond. If this would be a real world image, you, we wouldn't even know what some of these blocks or representation and entities in the representation would actually need to correspond to, which would make it quite hard to, to, to even start um, representation learning on them and validating them. And um, what we hope to do basically, and what one of these main ideas is, is that um, by learning these causal representations, you hope to build intelligent machines that generalize. And so what we he see here is one of these um, data sets of um, a benchmark of um, in the wild distribution shifts, which uh, gives you data across different locations and then ask you to generalize to an additional. So here you get data till 245 locations and then it's asked you to generalize to 246. Mm -hmm. So to a new location or to a new animal you've never seen before. And that is one aspect of generalization, which um, um, the community has now focused on. But generalization should actually go a little bit, bit further. So here, if you, for example, have this robot of picking up the cube on the top, then um, uh, it, and it pushes it away, you would argue that our mechanistic understanding of the scene of picking up this robot should actually be sufficient um, to then, for example, use that knowledge we acquired to restack a tower and reverse its order, which is shown on the bottom right. But while on the left, we've already made some progress in the community, how we can test better OOD generalization, like this repurposing and reusing knowledge is completely right now not, not working, I would argue. And I think that is an aspect we haven't spoken enough yet um, in, in generalization and um, that it's this repurposing and reusing of, of knowledge, which hopefully comes with a more factorized and more um, in a less densely connected um, mm. uh, connected structure um, or with some form of representation learning where we can then use and repurpose some of these factors. But that is a very hard problem. And, and um, unfortunately, yet unclear how it's best to make progress in that direction. But in order to do so, we at least provide now again, and it's an example from robotics, we provide a benchmark in the simulation environment to test and make advances. Because in, let's say in biomedicine, you wouldn't understand what these factors are, it would be very hard. While in robotics, it's among the most controlled setups we have and understand to make to, to make advances. So here, for example, all, all these generating factors of the scene are actually indicated here. So for example, color, friction, mass, and gravity. And you can um, independently intervene, for example, on gravity or color, and then see how well a policy which was trained in that environment actually generalizes to some of these tasks where only where, where there were only some intervention on one of these aspects like color friction and so on. And this is needed because for example, one of the main and leading um, benchmarks for um, 
for reinforcement learning is right now probably still Atari. But in Atari games, it's very hard to know what is shared between um, um, different levels of one game or even sh a shared underlying structure between two games. So it's quite hard to make systematic progress um, with respect to understanding when does something work or when does something not work. But here you would precisely see when does something work for color, when does something work for gravity and so on. And hopefully that would help you more to make uh, progress towards that goal. And the interesting part, I think, and we hosted a couple of challenges on that already on real systems, is that in robotics, you can actually test that on a real system. Um, so you can basically deploy your algorithm on a robot. Uh, so this is um, working through a cloud system. So you can just submit your approaches uh, through a submission system and test then how well you perform in, for example, picking up an object or shifting an object. Um, and this I find quite exciting. I think if we can do something similar in, in the biomedicine, where some of these approaches are slowly coming, that you can basically you get a data set and then you uh, you analyze it and you propose new interventions and then this is tested on the real setup that i think is an amazing um new way of of making progress um for for the community because we've likewise seen the dangers of having just a fixed holdout data set which out increasing it each time so these robotic systems and hopefully some of these new um, crispr technologies would enable us to generate new and new a holdout data each time. And some of these challenges, for example, in Gene Disco or this MIT challenge from Caroline Ula, go in that direction that actually you have a private leaderboard first where approaches are evaluated. And then the leading top 10 approaches are getting furthermore evaluated once more on a real system, um, which I think is, 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 is quite fantastic. And for us, so these are the, the final couple of slides, is, what these real world systems allow us is basically test precisely um, OOD generalization, but with respect to particular downstream tasks. So it's not just a metric of, for example, graph recovery or image um, reconstruction, but it's a metric which is directly correlated with the downstream tasks. So here, for example, we can train different representations on different colors. So the only factor we vary is, for example, here the color from this red to green. And then we train a downstream policy on top. So, for example, um, shifting a cube to a certain position. And now you can see if either the representation or the policy stays in distribution. So for example, you can push the object where you use a color where both the representation and the, um, and the uh, policy are still within the same color window. Then OOD distribution one is basically where just the representation is in distribution, but the policy is already um, not trained on that color. Then there's this out of distribution level two, where basically both the representation and the policy are not in distribution with respect to this color. And then finally, you can test it on the real system, where you use a completely new color, which was not included in the training data set of the representation or the policy. And um, in, in robotics, you have this nice um, ability to have a simulator and to have a real world experiment and lots of tremendous um, data sets already. And I think that's a similar setup, for example, for this gene regulatory networks, um, where we can uh, combine um, efforts, for example, to develop a simulator for these systems and then have a similar setup where we test them on the real world systems would be an, an exciting um, um, community effort where more where more um, groups need need to team up and um, and, and work together. Mm -hmm. And with this, I would already try to to summarize. So th these were unfortunately because I I showed a couple of um, a couple of um, related but but still um, uh, uh, but still broad uh, topics ranging from from uh, causality to representation learning to experimental design. And I I, I try to bring it. Um, together here again, um, but I wanted to indicate that there's a wide range of, of topics our lab is interested in, and if anyone um, is interesting to you for that, please reach out. We are more than happy to, to collaborate on most of these topics. Mm -hmm. And um, what I wanted to say is basically that full cost of discovery from observational um, data alone is, is, is very difficult and, and, and most likely will not work. But with interventional data, it becomes feasible, which is why we are so excited about these large-scale CRISPR perturbations. And um, unfortunately for us, as a machine learning community, it's it's too hard to evaluate these learned causal graphs um, 
with the existing databases, for example, and we really need domain knowledge and domain experts to help us evaluate how well these graphs actually perform. And um, because the overlap in the string database is most likely not, not the best way to evaluate them. It's just for us, from a community standpoint, right now the easiest to do so. And it would be very helpful if, if that becomes significantly easier. Um, another aspect is that I think we need to evaluate this causal um, graph learning, not with respect to a discovery, uh, with, with a graph recovery metric, but with respect to a particular downstream task. And there are a couple of natural downstream tasks for evaluating causality. So one is, for example, cause effect estimation, another one is imputation. And one particular one I'm excited about is experimental design. So where to intervene next? And I think testing these approaches with respect to their performance in experimental design is, is significantly more promising for differentiating what works and what doesn't work then comparing these approaches just with respect to their graph recovery metric, because the graph we discover might not necessarily be um, connected to our downstream task. So in some of these downstream tasks, not all the relations between these graphs might be relevant, which is a little bit hidden in these in these in these recovery metrics. And um, the final aspect is that it would be extremely helpful for us as a causality community, and I think this is. But as uh, a lot of these genetics and the interdisciplinarity would, would provide is to give and provide us um, real world benchmarks to test approaches at scale. And um, for example, by curating some of these data sets and providing additional evaluation techniques like sub network analysis and so on. And another aspect of, of this um, I'm very excited and, and look forward to is hopefully that sooner or later we will have efficient simulators. Um, of gene regulatory networks, for example, and interventions on these gene regulatory networks trained, for example, on some of these um, genome by perturbed CRISPR screens, such that we can actually try to benchmark um, approaches for experimental design using these simulators um, and, and make um, advances towards that goal before deploying that in, in the real world. And with that, I would, uh, I, I would close. Um, I, I, I need to thank a couple of collaborators, both from KTH, GSK, um, 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 ETH, and, and, and DeepMind. And uh, I provide a couple of references here. And with that, I, I would be very open and, and happy to discuss some questions you might have. Or if right now you already have to leave, I would be very happy to basically follow up any anytime by, by email or um, as well invite you for a talk or a visit to, um, to Munich. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks so much, Stefan. Uh, so yeah, it's a Q&A time. Uh, so let me stop the recording.